Your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to find the lost tribes of Israel. This message will self-destruct in five seconds. Welcome to the God Culture, where we urge you to challenge tradition as 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. We do not intend to be confrontational, but to compare what the Bible really says versus the traditions of men which Jesus himself rebuked. Jesus said to the Pharisees, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Mark 7.9 Coming off of the history of Christopher Columbus especially, which we will bring in again later in this series, we are laying foundation. It's time to explore some other references from multiple sources and will include many historians and scholars. In fact, in this video, we are going to prove something that the rabbis have not been able to figure out. Because we're smarter? No. Because we believe the Bible and in restoring it, the keys and the clues are all right there. That's where you start. The Bible is so brilliantly written that the common man can read it and understand it, even when it eludes the scholar. We know many will fight traditional mindsets through this series because we have all been trained to believe a certain way. Set that aside. Check out what our research has uncovered and then go out and prove all things for yourself. This is the only way to guard your heart lest you be deceived. This is your mission if you choose to accept it. In the Pharisee Targum of Pseudo-Jonathan, don't worry, we're going to vet this, we'll keep you in safe territory where scripture is concerned. But many have set out to prove this reference to find the lost tribes, and no one, even the rabbis, have any clue where to head. We do. Watch this. I will take them from there and place them on the other side of the Sambatyan River. Sambat Yan, also Sambat Yan, and Sabat Yan, a legendary river across which part of the ten tribes were exiled by the Assyrian king Shalmaneser, and which rested on the Sabbath, thus the name. Now, they were not exiled there by the Assyrians, so that part's not actually correct. But some of our longtime viewers are already picking up on where this heads. When we find information like this, the real question is, where did it come from? No, the reference straight out is not necessarily reliable, but its origin makes sense. There's something to this, and that's why we want to explore this. We see this a little in Pharisee land especially, and this is a perfect opportunity to illustrate this for you to see for yourself. So obviously this Pharisee reference also appears in the Talmud. Again, we do not use this nor view it as scripture. But let's research the historic reference here because it ties and it matters. According to the Jerusalem Talmud, however, Sanhedrin 10629C, the exiles were divided into three. Only one third went beyond the Sabbathion Sabbath River. A second to Daphne of Antioch, which is an area in Antioch we'll explore, and over the third there descended a cloud which covered them. In other words, they stayed in the same place. We'll deal with that. But all three would eventually return. So already the Pharisees expand the passage, as now it includes three places instead of one. Well, that's okay. We'll explain this so even a Pharisee can understand. The first description of miraculous qualities of this river is found in the Talmud when Rufus asked Akiva how he could prove that the Sabbath was divinely ordained as the day of rest. He replied, let the river Sambatyan prove it. We know, that sounds like 
Pharisee nonsense, doesn't it? But indulge us, because actually, the Sabbath river does prove it. That's actually not an inaccurate statement. It was unnavigable on weekdays because it flowed with strong currents carrying along stones with tremendous force. Really. But it rested on the Sabbath. Huh. So a river stops flowing every seventh day? Well, if ever there was such a thing, it had to have been before the flood, as there is no river on earth today, which matches that description. But they'll look for it and speculate, but we'll help them. It's okay. These passages give no indication as to the supposed location of the river or of the origin of its name. Well... Sabbath doesn't have an origin? Well, yeah, it does, because it is the origin. But note, they don't know where this river is. We will find it today. The only inference that can be drawn from them, the rabbis, is that it was located in Media. Wrong. Though there are lost tribes there, wrong river. It does not fit any of these descriptions. The most extensive description of both its name and locality is given by Nemonides. He identified the river with the river goes on of the Bible, which doesn't fit the description, or the writer of this article would have accepted that answer, wouldn't he? Though there are lost tribes there, too. Explaining the name on the basis of Numbers 11.31 as meaning removed, i.e., the ten tribes were removed from the rest of the people. Now, that is good, but the lost tribes which were removed are not just in media, modern Kurdistan, are they? Nemonides also held that its name derived from its Sabbath Rest, since Sabbat was the local word for Sabbath. To that we agree. Pliny the Elder described the river in its natural history, and his observations agree with the rabbinic sources. Well, they're not really observations because he never saw the Sabbath river, but he also claimed that the river ran rapidly for six days in the week and rested on the Sabbath. Okay, that's a change. This characteristic of the Sambatyan prevented the ten tribes from leaving their place of exile, since they could not cross the river during the six days of the week, and though it rested on the seventh day, the restrictions on travel on the Sabbath rendered the crossing equally impossible. Uh, No, not impossible. Unless, uh, let's see, they were rebelling against Yahuwah God, which is why and what they would have to do in order to leave someplace where he did not want them to leave in the first place, if he held them there. And then they would just break the Sabbath and travel in rebellion. Not so hard to figure out, is it there, Pliny? That... That Pliny sure does sound like a Pharisee, though, doesn't he? Hmm. Josephus, remember, a Pharisee, a royal Hasmonean by his own admission, and we will prove he also admitted he was an Essene as well. However, describe the periodicity of this river in a different fashion. Okay, another change. Claiming that it was quiescent on weekdays and flowed only on the Sabbath. Okay, he related that when Titus marched from Beirut to the other Syrian cities, displaying the Jewish captives, he observed a unique river. Well, not by proof, he didn't, not to match this. It ran between Arce at the northern extremity of the Lebanon range and Raphanea. Josephus adds, it has an astonishing peculiarity for when it flows. It is a copious stream with a current far from sluggish 
then all at once its sources fail. And for the space of six days, it presents the spectacle of a dry bed. Well, no one's ever observed that, have they? Again, as though no change had occurred. It pours forth on the seventh day just as before, and it has always been observed to keep strictly to this order. No, it hasn't. Whence they have called it the sabbatical river. No, so naming it after the sacred seventh day of the Jews. Okay, according to this description, there is no explanation for the inability of the ten tribes to cross the Sabbat Yon during the weekdays when it doesn't flow. Yeah, good point. Notice how the story is evolving, though. This is a point we wish to make. It's not done either. But we'll sort this all out. No worries. Eldad Hadani claimed that the Sabbatheon did not surround the land of the Ten Tribes. Oh, another change. But rather, that of the children of Moses. Hmm. Well, so here we go. The children of Moses are surrounded by a river resembling a fortress. Wow, now it's a fortress, which contains no water. Oh, there's no water in the river. That's why they can't find it. No wonder everyone's missing it, right? But rather rolls sand and stones with great force. Where's that been observed? Nowhere on earth. If it encountered a mountain of iron, it could undoubtedly grind it into powder. Dude, now that's a river. Or no, it's moving sand and rock or... I don't know what that is. So, a complete change to the story based on... What, what, what proof does he offer? None. Nothing. They're just talking. But do you see how it gets so inflated and expanded over time? You see this? This is acceptable and status quo in Pharisee land. And we'll show you why. And no quote is complete without a statement from the false Messiah, Shabbatai Zevi and his followers, whose followers, by the way, are still trying to bring about the conditions for the rise of the beast, which is their Messiah. That sounds kind of like uh, Christopher Columbus, doesn't it? Hmm, maybe those things tie together, but let's continue. For a similar tale, see the letter of Nathan of Gaza to Raphael Joseph, 1665. The students were to wait for Shabbatai Sevi to return after the seven-day wedding celebration and to redeem them. Wow, this guy's really a messiah, isn't he? Ah, no, he's not. If they were worthy of it, if they were not worthy, he would stay beyond the Sabbath, yon, the river, and great troubles would befall Israel. Oh, boy. Sounds more like superstition, doesn't it? This is how interpretations of the Bible run with the Pharisees. They may even start with the Bible or with a truth, but as they get a hold of it, this is where it always heads, and I mean always. Why? Matthew 16. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread? Which, when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye amongst yourselves? Because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? 
How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread? This isn't about bread. That ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What does this mean? Pharisee doctrine, just like Pharisee legal systems and even constitutions, ebb and flow and evolve. They have no real foundation. What does the Bible say? A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. That's a Pharisee. It's referring to this kind of doctrine. So what does leaven do? Because this analogy, as expected from Messiah, really nails it. Leavening agent, a substance causing expansion of doughs. Think about that. And batters by the release of gases <laughs> with such mixtures, producing baked products with porous structure. Such agents include air, steam, yeast, baking powder, and baking soda. Most bakery products are leavened or aerated by gas bubbles developed naturally or folded in. So why does Pharisee thinking so often lead to either a complete dead end or a fork in the road with no way to take either route? Because the leaven of the Pharisees is the expansion of the word. The dough is the word. And it's being expanded. Expanded in meaning and in definition. It is allegory. See, they call it allegory, and then they can apply their leaven. The word allegory is the leaven, because if you say it's allegory, then that means I can read that passage to say whatever I want. And in fact, even better, I can read it 10 different ways, and all are correct, because none is wrong, because everyone is entitled to interpret the Bible, except the Bible is clear and not open to allegory, except for when it says it is. So, why does Pharisee thinking lead down this route? Because it is the expansion of the word. They took the Torah and massively expanded and continue to expand it every day. They do the same in the legal profession, the same with government laws, the same with constitutions, and they even take credit for all of those systems, and we will cover that. Everything is bombarded with what? Gas bubbles, because that's what they're full of, causing it to expand. And they certainly do that here, but... We can find the Sabbath river. We can take the leaven out of these references because it's obvious when you have a foundation in Scripture. Let's go back to the very first Sabbath in Genesis 2. Thus, because it's not a Hebrew or a Jewish thing. Sabbath is a Yahuwah God thing, and Adam observed it from the beginning. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, Yahuwah God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, and there's many references that say forever, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which Yahuwah God created and made. See, Adam was there with him for the very first Sabbath. And where were they? Well, they were right next to where the Garden of Eden would be created the very next day, but it was not created yet. According to the book of Jubilees, they were in the land of creation called Elda, 
Genesis confirms this. It is the same land which Adam and Eve settled in after their exile from the garden. We'll show a quick reference on that. That land is Havila, named for Hava, which is Eve's real Hebrew name, meaning one who suffers pain that brings forth. What's that? Eve's curse, childbirth. This map is wholly explained in parts 10 and 12 of Solomon's Gold series. So if you have a question on it, go review that first because you're not going to get a full perspective if this is the first time you've seen it. Havila is the Philippines, and it is surrounded by the Pisan River, which flows from the river of Eden, the river from Eden. In that land is gold. Philippines is number one in all of history. Pearl, delium, is pearl. We proved that. No, it's not African resin. That's not very bright. Certainly not in the other references that the word is used, and it's only used twice. So it's pretty easy. Philippines, number one largest pearls in the world. There's no close second because they're also number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, number seven. There is no place on earth with the size of pearls that the Philippines has found. And the onyx stone, which many confuse, but we prove is the onyx stone similar to that used for countertop and construction today. Not the jewel, and which Philippines has not only the onyx stone, but the number one strongest onyx and marble in the world even stronger than that of Italy, Carrera marble. And it is very abundant, especially in the Romblon region, of which Romblon is an ancient mountain. That's what we call an island today. These were ancient mountains before the flood. And it is made of the onyx stone. The Pisan River is mentioned in the Apocrypha book of Sirach as overflowing, which actually meets some of the initial descriptions from the rabbis that we read. There's something to this, even though they add their leaven, of course. And the word Pisan in Hebrew means increase, overflowing. So, makes sense, doesn't it? Oh, and get this, its root word Push means to spread or be scattered. You mean like the lost ten tribes? Exactly. Where else would Yahuwah God scatter them than the Scatter River? Of course, that holds a prophetic name from thousands of years ago, from Genesis 2. Imagine that. Remember, Nemonides was the one who said Sambat Yan meant removed, which is awfully similar to scattered, isn't it? These are the same. But remember the crushing definition of one of the rabbis claiming it flowed of sand and stone, pulverizing mountains even? Wow, and it wore a cape as well. But anyway, check out the word pisan. Yep, it's there in Tagalog, of all things, the national language of the Philippines, which is Havila, surrounded by the ancient Pisan River, which has been likened unto Hebrew as a language even. But we deal with that in part seven of Solomon's Gold series in great detail and find many indisputably Hebrew references. You can look at them all and say, oh, well, this one, or maybe that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when you find the name of Joktan's brother on the largest mountain, the tallest mountain on Luzon, yeah, maybe, just maybe, that means something. It means, in Tagalog, Pisan means steam roller or to crush. <laughs> Imagine that. It all ties. So again, remove the leaven, And you find there may actually be a truth behind it. We're not suggesting that the Talmud is truth. No. We're not suggesting that the Pharisees are propagating truth. 
No. When they do, it is lined with leaven. But if you take the leaven out, you can then test it to see if it is at least based on some ancient truth. It came from somewhere. There's some origin to the Sabbath river. This makes sense. And we can't skip a full definition of Havila. Look how not just one definition, but all of these fit. This happens with words that appear in the days of Adam and in the Garden of Eden, because these are words of origin, which can take on multiple meanings over time, which all point, though, to the very same function. And it typically ties many times all of the definitions. Check this out. Circle. Well, it is encircled by the Pisan River, so that makes sense. A whirling in circular motions or a writhing in agony. Well, gee, that matches some of the rabbi's description of the Sabbath River, doesn't it? Agony, circular motions, whirling. Dancing, shuddering of mountains during an earthquake. Whoa, you mean like the pulverizing mountains? Gee, sounds similar, doesn't it? Contractions during the labor of childbirth. Now there's Havaz, Eve's curse again. And remember, this is the land where the first baby was conceived and birthed. No, not conceived by Satan. That is a false doctrine, and we will eventually uh, produce a video on that. But feel free to hit us in comments, and we'll respond and show you a very quick uh, an easy way to determine that scripture actually proves the serpent seed doctrine wrong. Now, averting motions of people who fear the wrath of God. Wow, you mean like Adam, Enoch, Noah, later Ophir, Sheba, and now the lost tribes of Israel? Yeah, that fits. To whirl may lie in the image of sand being blown about by a whirling wind. You think maybe these rabbis knew something they weren't telling? Because that certainly sounds like the river that wasn't actually water, but sand and rock, which pulverized mountains, doesn't it? There it is again. Wow. To be firm or to endure. Might. You mean God's, and he just so happens to have his holy of holies there in the Garden of Eden, according to the Book of Jubilees. Man's, you mean Adam's, the lost tribes, or even plants, the might of plants. Well, boy, is that true? Because the Philippines is extremely fertile, a rainforest in classification, in fact. Wealth. Hmm. You mean the wealthiest land on earth before the Spanish stole it? And with all the resources now discovered and gold even returning? Hmm. They will rise, just as the prophecy from Messiah says. Or worthiness. You mean like the righteous from the east? Hmm. But both in the sense of might-giving substance. A synonym for army, that is, the king's force. You mean like Yahuwah, God's army? Healthy or strong, growing stronger. Well, there's that prophecy again. The queen of the south shall rise in judgment with this, this uh, generation and condemn it. Hmm. Sounds similar, doesn't it? And dream. You mean like the secret cornerstone who will be the ones to usher in the lost tribes? You know, the ships of Tarshish will bring your sons and daughters from afar. You know, Isaiah knew what he was talking about. So did Jeremiah. All of these, these all tie when you look at things with the proper biblical perspective. This is the beauty of the Bible. When a word like this can have what seems to be so many different definitions, yet they all tie together to his purpose. So let's unravel this. 
The Talmud said the exiles were divided into three. They certainly were when they were sent into the land, as there were three areas they were sent to principally by uh, the Assyrians, which marked the borders of, we showed you, modern Kurdistan. But these three are the second exodus, specifically, and where the lost tribes are in two places, not three, and we'll prove this. We just proved the Sabbath River is the Pisan River, which identifies with Havila, Philippines, which is accurate. So, this reference, actually, we'd agree with number one. Number two, Daphne of Antioch. This is interesting. We haven't mentioned that city yet, but look at the map from the Kurdish project and notice in modern times, the Kurd territory includes, would you look at that, Daphne, Antioch. See the inset? So that is a reference to Kurdistan still, or at least where the Kurds are in great number, as is the third, because the ones who were covered by a cloud, or really a mountain range, which you'll see, which surrounds them and they're shut in or quarantined and protected in that area by the mountains, are those who stayed in Assyria in where? Modern Kurdistan. So still we're in Kurdistan. So it's two areas in Kurdistan that are being identified. And yes, they match, don't they? Further confirmation from... An unlikely source, perhaps. But wait a minute. Antioch is one of the places where the lost tribes are? Hmm. Where did we see that even in the New Testament? Ha! Acts 11. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia Phoenicia, and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. We're going to explore that word because the word Jew is never used in Scripture. It's a transliteration from more modern times. There was never a J in Hebrew, ever in ancient Hebrew nor in Greek, nor in Latin, nor even in Aramaic. So, the word is wrong, no matter how you say it. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Let's skip to verse 26. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. That's ecclesia. Again, the word church never in scripture. Ecclesia, which simply means gathering. And taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. We will deal with that at some point. We're not going to get into that. So this is the very first ecclesia outside of Judea. Now remember, again, no word church in the Bible. That's not a Greek word. The Greek word is ekklesia, which simply means gathering. And it is defined by Messiah when he says, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. That's it. That is the only requirement. Imagine that. They were lost tribes then. But that means when the word Jew, which is not actually Jew, it's Yahudim, is used, it may actually refer to the lost tribes of the northern kingdom as well as Judeans. See, we've always been told that word only means either the tribe of Judah or those that lived in Judea, the southern kingdom, the three tribes that were there, Judah, Benjamin, and possibly some of the Levites. 
But is that true? Because in this context, we know that lost tribes were there. And it says that they're only going to Jews. Something is awry here. Perhaps someone is trying to take over all the blessings from that word being used, yet Yahuwah God knows who his people are. His Yahudim. No, it's not an A. I mean, it's not an E, because if it was Y-E-H, then why even do the rabbis say Eliyahu? Well, the yod He is Hyah, not Hugh. It's never Hugh, it's Yah. It is Yahudim, which means Yah's people. This is a direct reference to them being Yah's people. All the more reason why it does not refer to just Judea. Now, in the days of the Romans, did it refer to just Judea? Well, that's all that was there. The lost tribes weren't there, but they were the remainder of the Yahudim. But they were not ever the entire Yahudim as is being claimed. Now, we are going to explore that and really prove that out. Give us time. We have an entire video where we're going to even go through New Testament references on the lost tribes. And we'll explain all of this further. But we can only do so much in one video. Another reference for historical context only. But remember, whether you want to call these scripture or not, and we will never make case that this is, these are historical documents written a long time ago. So there is something to them, even if they're not completely true. So this is the Ethiopic Acts of St. Matthew. The lost tribes live in a place to the east. Yeah, you got that right. Which is not cold, but pleasant, right? Philippines. And where a son does not die before his father. That's an addition again. Where the body suffers neither pain nor sores and dies after a long life and in a state of rest. That's an addition that's non-biblical because the Bible makes it clear many times that the lost tribes will suffer uh, in the areas in which they go uh, until they're finally regathered in the end times. That is clear strewn throughout scripture. So no, we don't buy that. Again, we'll test everything with scripture. The people of the lost tribes fulfill the law, are hidden beyond a river called Sambatyan in some Jewish works, and shall return to the land of Israel in order to rescue their captured mother, Jerusalem. Well recorded in prophecy. We'd agree with that. They desire neither gold nor silver, hmm, added, neither eat flesh, Mm, added, they're not vegetarians necessarily. We don't find that in other references, really. Nor drink wine, that we do. They are nourished by honey and dew. Wow, is that added. And drink water, now this is interesting, flowing from paradise. You mean the Garden of Eden. Yep, Philippines. A man has one wife, and each is free from sexual lust. Added, they offer their firstborn to Yahuwah God. Maybe, but maybe not. Again, added, they do not lie, and youths do not speak in the presence of adults, which is actually very similar to the Filipino culture, but again, we believe added. A lot of these are added, but quite a bit of them have another reference which may explain all of this, and we'll get to that. And in 1846, Reverend Thomas Stackhouse, note, a vicar of the Church of England, no less. Yeah, we'll keep an eye on this guy, too as he quotes a Pharisee trying to figure out the markers, but there is something to this once again, and his interpretation is not necessarily off. It's actually pretty good, so we wish to share it. Another Jewish author, 
He's referring to the Italian Jewish author, R. Abraham Peristal, or Ferrisol, who lived in 1451 to 1526. In his description of the world, has found out very commodious habitations for the ten tribes. So he's talking about the lost ten tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel. And in many places has given them a glorious establishment. See how they seem to know these things back then. But we've lost that knowledge. Why? You can answer that. In a country which he calls Parasha. Sounds like Persia. But let's see. Let's test it. Enclosed by unknown mountains and bounded by Assyria. Wow. Sounds like Kurdistan, doesn't it? He has settled some. So some are there of the ten tribes in the north, and made them a flourishing, populous kingdom. Yeah, about 45 million today, in fact, although not all necessarily Hebrews. Others he places in the desert of Kabor, which, according to him, lies upon the Indian Sea, where they live. Okay, so this isn't the Kabor that we saw uh, identified with the river goes on. No. No, that's not what this is, because this is in the Indian Sea, the Indian Ocean, or actually lies upon the Indian Sea, which, by the way, extends all the way to the Indies. So, where they live in the manner of the ancient Rechabites. We'll explain who they are. Without houses, hmm, sowing, planting, or the use of wine. Nay, he enters the Indies, the Isles of Bengala, The Philippines, specifically, he's calling out the Philippines and several other places. We will vet this. Okay, so he comes right out with it here. Almost. He identifies the Philippines accurately and the Indies, which the Philippines is in the Indies in ancient references. So that's pretty neat. But we'll have to figure out the rest here. So let's break this down. Enclosed by mountains, bounded by Assyria. Well, that fits Kurdistan, doesn't it? Some settle there, is referring to 2nd Estrus. That's where they're drawing from for that source, obviously, because of the two places. Pharisee is from a Greek word, pharisais, however you say it, taken from the Hebrew Aramaic word parasha, meaning separated one. Are the lost tribes separated in the mountains of Kurdistan? You better believe it. And this reference is even mentioning the the separation specifically. However, Parsi also means Persian. Parasha, Pharisee, Persia, specifically Kurdistan. This is a reference to Persia, specifically the Zagros Mountains, enclosing the Kurds as the above map from 977 A.D. shows Kurdistan in the middle, surrounded by the mountains and completely enclosed in by those mountains. Even the background photo of Kurdistan fits, doesn't it? This confirms our findings from Scripture. Just need to go back far enough, I guess. Others he places in the desert of Kabor, which, according to him, lies upon the Indian Sea, where they live in the manner of the ancient Rechabites, without houses, sowing, or the use of wine. Nay, he enters the Indies, the Isles of Bengala, the Philippines, and several other places. For the desert of Kabor, specifically, We are going to set this one aside and address it in our video regarding the landing location of the lost tribes in the Philippines, where we can fully vet this out and prove it and ties in with the subject of the video. We believe we find this desert in the Philippines, and we'll show you. We all know where the Indies are. The East Indies, so let's deal with the Isles of Bengala. 
First, no doubt India is referred to as Bengali, and in some languages even Bengala. However, mainland India does not have significant isles. There's Sri Lanka and some very, very small islands, but in history especially, the islands of India have pretty much referred to the Indies, not ones off of the mainland specifically. But this word Bengala appears to be two Hebrew words. Ben means son or child a thousand times in the Bible. Gala denotes an uncovering of sensory organs such as the ear or the eye. Well, that could certainly tie to the lost tribes, couldn't it? Indicating a propensity to hear or see. The lost tribes are exposed. Their sin has been exposed. And they prostrate before Yahuwah God, right? It may indicate the revealing of someone, a human person or God, a secret, like the secret cornerstone, uh, Pilipinas, the lost tribes of the Philippines, or a message. It may indicate indecent exposure or even the intent to commit immoral acts. Well, actually, that could tie too, because the lost tribes of Israel played the harlot. That's the actual language used. They played the harlot going after other gods, who, by the way, when you look into the rituals of those gods, sex rituals are huge in those cultures. So, it all ties, believe it or not. The secondary meaning of this verb, which may be a different verb altogether, or not, denotes a removing or going into exile. What? That has lost tribes written all over it, doesn't it? Two derivatives deal with captivity, gola, captivity or captive exile, and galu, also meaning captives and always covering a group of exiles, not just one, a group, the lost tribes. Is this the Isles of India? Or really, is it just a name for the Isles of the captives or exile? Let's vet this a little further. Remember, this author and the Pharisee he quotes do not know the exact details, but they're close. They're missing proper biblical geography by which to interpret their findings. Ezra 4.1 uses Ben Gala together as a reference to the children of captivity. I mean, this just gets better and better. This writer does not know exactly where they are, though, but he at least has pretty good directions. Not bad. He's not far off, and we'll explain. Knowing that the Isles of Bengala is an exact reference to the lost tribes and the Philippines is in the Indies, we believe all three names are actually referring to the very same area, the Philippines. How do we know? Because they are not the Garden of Eden, the land of creation. They are not in the Sea of Sinim that Isaiah defined, the South China Sea which was a huge clue. They are not surrounded by the Pisan River, the Philippines is, nor are they ancient Havila, but the Philippines is. There is no history tying the Hebrews to the other areas of the Indies. However, the abundant history since creation ties this to the Philippines, the Isles of the Children of Captivity. And Yahuwah God's presence is in the Garden of Eden, in His permanent Holy of Holies. The lost tribes don't need a temple, nor an Ark of the Covenant, because He's already there. These are the staples. These are, they make this simple. They are trying to get closer to Him. Him to return to His presence, just as they said in Esdras. So very few would have gone anywhere else unless they were off course, perhaps, and maybe, but likely not. 
they went to the Indies, but specifically to the Philippines. The Isles of Bengala is yet another connotation of the children of captivity, the Philippines. But an even bigger reason the lost tribes descend from Abraham, who is from who? Shem, not Ham, Shem. They would not disobey Noah's wishes and go into Ham's territory unless they had to. In the case of Judea, which we will cover, they had no choice but to go into Africa on the fringe and beyond the Roman Empire's jurisdiction because they were not welcome in the entire Roman Empire. But the lost tribes first reclaim Shem's territory in Israel which was taken by Canaan. Then they reclaim the area taken by Medai in Media, Persia, Kurdistan, which also was the former territory of their origin, as that was given to our fox sad, according to Jubilees, and Joktan and Peleg left from there. They divided there. Joktan went east and Peleg went west. We map that out in parts three and four of the flood series, and we refer you to that mapping because to jump into the middle of Noah's directions will tell you nothing with the context as they are turn by turn consecutive directions, and they're awesome. Check it out because we map all that out. Their destination in the east for the year and a half journey was in Shem's territory still, which is north of, in that area, on that border, and again, all this is in Jubilees, it is north of all the mountains of fire, which we covered as well, is a reference to Ganung Ganung, a P, which literally means the mountains of fire in Indonesia. That's what they call their Mountains, all 147 volcanoes fall under the connotation, the mountains of fire. And notice why Noah chose them. They form a natural border between Shem to the north and the Garden of Eden and Ham to the south. No, we're not proving that right now. We already proved that. So if you haven't watched that, go back and watch it because we do prove it. And we can't reprove it in this video. It takes four videos to prove that. To the east, the ancient Pisan River, now called the Philippine Trench, would have formed the border with Ham to the right of the Garden of Eden, according to Jubilees. Then Japheth inherited the cold areas of the north, but not mainland Asia, because that's Shem's. See our mapping. It's good and well supported. The Hebrews from Eber would have headed to Shem's territory, not Ham's, again, unless they were forced to do so. They were welcome in Ophir and Sheba and even Tarshish, just as they were in the days of Solomon, and just as the Ophirians came to Bethlehem to offer gifts to the Messiah. One has to wonder if they did not even claim at least some of Tarshish territories back as well, although we believe Tarshish either paid for that territory in the southern portion of the Philippines or it was his payment for the use of his ships because he was one of the Mariner brothers, the sons of Javan, Greece, which would have benefited benefited Ophir and Sheba at the time. Just a thought. And what about this reference? They live in the manner of the Rechabites. Who are they? Jeremiah 35. But they said, We will drink no wine, for Jonadab, the son of Rechab, Rechabites, our father commanded us, saying, Ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons forever, neither shall ye build houses, nor sow seed, nor plant vineyards, nor have any vineyards that you didn't plant. See? But all your days ye shall dwell in tents, that ye may live many days in the land where ye be strangers. We'll vet this. Verse 16, because the sons of Jonah 
Nadab, the son of Rechab, have performed the commandment of their father. So they literally did this, which he commanded them. But this people hath not hearkened unto me, referring to the tribes of Israel. Jeremiah 35, Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not want a man to stand before me forever. Sounds like the righteous from the east, doesn't it? And 2 Kings 10, And when he was departed thence, he lighted on Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him, and he saluted him and said to him, Is thine heart right, as my heart is with thy heart? And Jonadab answered, It is. He was righteous. If it be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand, and he took him up to him into the chariot. Now, the Rechabites were righteous pure in heart, and they were preparing spiritually for captivity, in fact. In fact, 2 Kings, if you read further, offers an account where they even destroyed the temple of Baal along with its priests. They burned down the idols of Baal and the temple. And there just so happens to be a statue of Baal's wife, in the Philippines today. We prove this in part nine of Solomon's Gold series, where we show an actual photograph of the statues of Semiramis, of Isis, of Ishtar, and we look at their faces up close and we compare them to what they call Mary. Now, all are the queen of heaven, but the queen of heaven is in Jeremiah and scripture. The queen of heaven is hated by Yahuwah God. So, There's an idol to deal with. And in time, the people will rise up and they will rid themselves of that image. So how did they live? Without houses. Now in his voyage with Magellan, Pigafetta, the historian, writes, We entered the port of Zebu, that's modern Zebu or Sheba, having passed by many villages. There we saw many houses which were built on trees. Still today, you see this kind of construction all over the Philippines, just as the picture to the right demonstrates. They literally use the trees as a foundation. And why not? They're already rooted into the ground. It does make sense. Later, on the invention of various tools allowed for the fabrication of tent-like shelters and tree houses. See, these were considered tent-like shelters and tree houses. These were tents. This is a definition of tents, which fits without houses, the way of the Rechabites. Ha, interesting. Early classical houses were characterized by rectangular structures elevated on stilt foundations and covered by voluminous thatched roofs ornamented with gable finials. And its structure could be lifted as a whole and carried to a new site. Now, Pigafetta and others chronicle vast amounts of gold even in the hands of the common man. Ophirians were wealthy, yet... Many chose to live in these kinds of structures still. Why? Well, it appears because they were living the way of the Rechabites. How about that? But what does it mean to be carried to a new site? Oh, we'll explain this. Now, one of our viewers actually sent us this, but we weren't sure what to do with it. We weren't sure how it quite tied in, though it sounded like it did. Now we know why. Listen to this. The concept of Bayanahan is traced back to in a country's tradition, which can be observed in rural areas, wherein the townspeople were asked, especially the men, to lend a hand to a family who will move 
into a new place. But get this, the relocation does not only involve moving the family's personal belongings, but most importantly, It concerns the transfer of the family's entire house to a new location. Does that not sound like Rackabites who live in tents? I can't imagine a better reference. A traditional Filipino house, a Baha'i Kubo, is made of indigenous materials such as bamboo and nipa anahal leaves. See? That's what the Rakabites would do. They would use the local supplies that were available to them, just like that. The Bayanahan spirit is still alive. There are still people in rural areas that transfer their house into another place, and people still help. Wow, what? You can't move your house? Ah, what a shame. Guess you aren't keeping up with the trends, are you? Why not be able to change the scenery whenever you want, right? More so, this sounds like the way of the Rakabites. This is the way they would live because this kind of living is similar to living in tents. This is why those demanding more archaeology, archaeological proof, to prove this whole notion of Ophir are clueless because we prove that it's Ophir and actually there is archaeology that proves it but you're looking for ancient cities they're looking for something that is not there it wasn't in the culture it wasn't in the culture when the Spanish came it wasn't in the culture they were wealthy yet they didn't build the architectural wonders. This is a people who leaves a light footprint, who is not aiming to build the great society. So you will not find the architecture that originates from Babylon, because that's where it comes from, with these lost tribes. Many think it's because they are poor, but that doesn't agree with history, and they don't get it. And by the way, if you are an American... Your government has more debt than all of the money supply in all of the entire planet. So, who's poor? Who's a third world country? We won't get into that. But you know, the funny thing is, is Filipinos are smarter than many think. ABS-CBN, in fact, tells us that 86% do not even have bank accounts. And you say, oh, those poor Filipinos, they don't even, they can't even afford a bank account. No, 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 no. That's not it. It's because they're smarter than that. Because they're not willing to pay fees and outrageous interest, which is greater today than what it was when they were exiling bankers in the 1500s for the so-called 44% absorbent interest. And you hear that and you're like, oh, 44%, that's horrible. Oh, they should have kicked them out of the country. (laughs) You can't do your math. Because a loan, a housing loan with 5% interest, because of the way it compounds, ah, the leaven of the Pharisees, The 5% interest loan that you're taking out, let's say you take out a loan for $100,000, which you can't find a home for in the U.S. today pretty much, maybe in some of the rural areas. So you take out a loan for $100,000, go and do, go online right now, go to Google, pick out a mortgage calculator, any, and put in $100,000 over a 30-year period, which is the average loan. How much interest are you paying? Do you have it up? About $130,000 in interest on a $100,000 loan? What is that percentage? Oh, that's not 44%, is it? Oh, no, that's over 100% interest. You're paying more than double for that house. So who's smarter? Filipinos who own their land outright with no loans in many cases? who 86% don't have bank accounts, or those with debt, which is poverty by any true standard. Now, as far as sowing seed, the Philippines 
culture is full of agriculture, we admit. And we don't have an explanation for that. But again, we're also looking at modern times. But even if you look back at when Pigafetta came, certainly there was a lot of agriculture going on. However, are there peoples within who are not sowing? And that very well still could be the case. I don't have anything to prove that out for that portion of the reference. Regarding wine and vineyards, well, there was a palm wine mentioned in Pigafetta's journal, but no grapes and no wine made from grapes. We don't know exactly whether or not that is, you know, it, it, enough to say, oh, see, they, they didn't uh, drink wine. Because obviously they did drink palm wine in those days. But again, you're looking at the 1500s, not 500, 600 BC, which is about the period when this occurred. So those we don't have explanations for, but everything else, wow. I mean, just wow. Now remember too, Magellan came almost 2,000 years after the second exodus. But what about relationship? Because the Rechabites had relationship and dedication to Yahuwah God. It's not enough to say the righteous from the East. Let's see if we can find something in history to support this. Pigafetta again writes, Then he, Magellan, asked whether they were Moors, Muslims, or Gentiles, and in what they believed. They answered that they did not perform any other adoration, but only joined their hands, looking up to heaven, and that they called their God Abba. Hearing this, the captain was very joyful on seeing that the first king raised his hands to the sky and said that he wished it were possible for him to be able to show the affection which he felt towards him. Notice something. What idols did they worship? None. What was their religion called? It did not have a name according to Pigafetta, because it wasn't a religion. What it was, and what's being described here, is a close relationship. Abba, as we covered, is the personal name of Yahuwah God, used by Messiah in the very Garden of Gethsemane. Abba, meaning my father. Yes, my father, not just father. The thing is, it's not Spanish. Abba is not Spanish. It's Aramaic. And no, the Muslims don't use it to refer to Allah. And more so, they were asked if they were Muslims. And they said, no. They did not identify with religion, but relationship. A personal one, which could worship Abba, any time, anywhere. No buildings, temples, or churches necessary. Just an organic relationship with him, just as the Rechabites. Now, this ties together. We want to be clear. Yes, Pigafetta does mention he went to an island, I believe Kugayan Sulu, if, if my memory serves me correctly, which in fact had some Muslims on it. So yes, there were some Muslims in the land, and we see that today. They're usually in the southern portion. But the Philippines was never penetrated by Islam. Very, very small degree, and even today only 5% is Muslim. So no, it did not come from Islam. Because you're talking about something that was pretty widespread because we see that all over the place. We've even heard from, I'd say, hundreds at least of Ilocanos uh, from the northern part of Luzon who've said that they, their ancestors, have referred to Yahuwah God as Abba in antiquity. So this is not news. This is not new. But all of this ties together. 
Now, we have covered many things through the series already which tie the Philippines to Israel in many ways. However, we have never discussed a huge one, and that is the Thule. Thule is a Filipino rite of male circumcision. How in the world did that get into the Philippines? Islam? Nope. We'll prove it. It has a long historical tradition and is considered an obligatory rite of passage for males. Boys who have not undergone the ritual are labeled supat and face ridicule from their peers. Circumcision is not considered a religious rite as some four-fifths of Filipinos profess Roman Catholicism, which does not require it. So it's not a Catholic tradition. And by the way, notice supot is how they ridicule those who are what? Well, what does the Bible say? What did David call Goliath? An uncircumcised Philippine, or Philistine, sorry, not Philippine. I guess here they'd be an uncircumcised Philippine, right? Okay, so it's interesting that that transfers all the way over to the Philippines. How did that get there? doesn't make sense, does it? Unless you know your Bible and your history. Rather, circumcision is a social norm rooted in tradition that is followed by society at large. Most boys usually undergo the procedure not shortly after birth, but prior to reaching puberty or before high school around ages 10 to 14, which, by the way, Abraham was not circumcised as a child. He was circumcised Later, he circumcised even adult males who were in his household. So, not necessarily something that has to be done at birth. Hmm. Now, that is an interesting tie, indeed. Antonio de Morga, almost a hundred years after Magellan, records... A few years before the Spaniards subdued the island of Luzon, certain natives of the island of Borneo began to go thither to trade, especially to the settlement of Manila and Tondo, and the inhabitants of the one island intermarried with those of the other. These Borneans are Mohammedans. Muslims, and were already introducing their religion among the natives of Luzon. Were they? Hmm. Let's see if that sticks, Uh, because it didn't. And we're giving them instructions, ceremonies, and the form of observing their religion by means of certain gazes, whatever, uh, whom they brought with them. Already a considerable number, and those the chiefest men, were commencing, although by piecemeal, to become Moros and were being circumcised and taking the names of Moros. Okay, some did. Fair. That's fine. I'm sure they did. Had the Spaniards coming been delayed longer, that religion would have spread throughout the island and even through the others, and it would have been difficult to extirpate it. Now, of course, There's a lot of sale in here, (laughs) a salesmanship, to justify the Spaniards uh, basically raping and stealing from the Filipinos. And somehow that's justifiable because, you see, we we stopped Islam. Uh, No, the Filipinos had already stopped Islam and always have and still do today. Okay, its encroachment is minimal throughout the country. But De Morgan makes an observation, which is fine. But see, he interprets it through the eyes of a Jesuit who dare not make the connection to more ancient times because it would disprove the Jesuit narrative. He is not offering a true scientific connection here. He's just writing this happened. Well, yeah, Muslims went to Luzon. Perhaps some people in Luzon did in fact accept Islam. But if it were a great number, where are they today? Because they're literally almost non-existent. Yeah, maybe in Manila, but still percentage-wise, non-existent. It is not a significant religion, really in all of the Philippines, except for the very southern tip. Now, we'll prove that out. And according to the Journal of the Association of Military Surgeons in 1903, 
At that time, 80% of Filipinos were being circumcised even at that point. And today... According to a report on State of the Nation in May last year, 93% of Filipino males are circumcised. Yet, only 5% of the Philippines is Muslim. Five. How does one reconcile now that we have the data, which De Morga did not, in all fairness, Obviously, there is no evidence the majority of the Philippines was ever Muslim, as its encroachment into the north was basically halted. If it had gained a stronghold on those areas, you wouldn't have Magellan identifying Filipinos as non-Muslim, which he did. Which he did other than some of the smaller islands. Deducing that 93% of Filipino men today get circumcised, yet only 5% are Muslim, requires far more than a giant leap in logic to tie the two together. It would be statistically impossible. Also, we know it is not a Catholic practice nor encouraged. Yet, it has survived despite 400 years of Catholic dominance. And still, 93% perform the right. Why? There's only one explanation. It is a far more ancient practice before the Catholics, which they themselves document, and before the Muslims, who never really put more than a small dent into the Philippines, really. In fact, notice, there is practically no presence of Islam in the lands of Ophir and Sheba, as it is predominantly in the land of Tarshish, who was from Japheth, not Shem, and his family was not as righteous as Shem, according to the Bible. And some members of his family, such as Eber, Shem's family, who fathered both Peleg, where Abraham came from, and Joktan, where Ophir and Sheba, Havilah, came from, in lieu of all the abundant proof, we believe this is obvious. This practice either came from the lost tribes who came to the Philippines, or, and it doesn't have to come from there, it preceded that even with Ophir and Sheba from Shem, or it came from Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, who learned about the practice on her trip because they were related through Eber. Hebrew. We derive the term Eber, or the term Hebrew, from Eber. We'll prove that out further. We do have some people that argue with us on that, but we will prove it. The relationship was refueled when Solomon's navy came to Ophir and Sheba and further forged with the diplomatic trip of the Queen of Sheba, who was from Ophir's brother, not Cush. This continued, as we prove, even into the days where the wise men came, according to Psalm 72, from Sheba, Seba, Tarshish, and the Isles, Ophir. Yes, this means Ophirians knew Yahusha, Jesus, long before the Spanish ever came, and they knew him well enough to reject Islam, too. In fact, for thousands of years, as evidenced by Pigafetta, they rejected religion and had an organic relationship with Yahuwah, God, that was replaced by Catholicism. They had the relationship of Adam, Enoch, Noah, and Shem, just as the Rechabites did. These ties are indisputable when you examine their culture, as there are still even traces today, despite the onslaught of the Catholic control religion, the Islamic control religion.
The very same place Adam was exiled from the garden is the very same place where the lost tribes are exiled today. Arsareth, the land of creation, the land of Havilah, even bearing Havas, Eve's name, surrounded by the Sabbath river, meaning removed, the Pisan, meaning scattered. It's the same. These aren't just coincidences. The lost tribes were heading to the same land as Joktan's sons, Ophir, Sheba, and Tarshish, to Safar, a Hebrew reference to the tree of life, and the mount of the east, according to Genesis 10, which are both in the Garden of Eden, Philippines. Now, we will examine this year and a half journey. What path did they take? Did they take ships? And if so, what kind and whose? We will thoroughly vet this in the next video. And once again, you will find the Bible not only offers clues, but it boxes this into a very narrow path when one applies the logic of all the passages together at once. The Bible is real. Thank you for watching the Lost Tribes series. Please share this video with others and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to click the bell and view our website at the.culture.com. Always remember to prove all things for yourself. Yahuwah, God bless.